Over of the rainbow so that we don't play the same thing over and over again. One of the things I've been trying to accomplish now is to get some real new fresh ideas. Aren't you excited about that? I am. Some new fresh ideas, some new things that are going on in our local assembly. And also, I want to remind you of the fact that now that the conference is coming up, I can already see you get ready for the distractions in your personal life because they always come up whenever there's a conference. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about it. Do you know why? Because for the past two or three years, God the Holy Spirit has been preparing us for this great time that is about to come up, which is to celebrate the royal family of God being gathered together as we see that day approach when he is coming back. Amen? And uh, how was your 4th of July? I hope that it was good. Mine was fantastic. Uh, I studied all day. That was the most fantastic thing I could do because I just love doing my most precious thing, which, which is to study. I know many of you have spent time with your family. I spent time with my family as well, but nothing better than spending time with the royal family of God. That's my personal opinion. You can come to your own. But the main reason that we are here once again is because the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathe, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As we enter into our fifth message on the doctrine of the dispensation of promise, turn in your Bibles this evening, or this morning, this, yes, this evening, to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews, the 11th chapter. <clears throat> Once again, as is our custom, we do take that moment of silent prayer to enter into fellowship with God which means to examine our own life, naming and citing any known sins if we have any, because if we do, we need to be filled or controlled by God the Holy Spirit, who is our true mentor and our true teacher. And therefore, that means if we want to be in fellowship with him, we have to check ourselves, examine our own lives to see whether or not we are in the faith and ready to study the word of God, which is, alike, again, alive and powerful. A moment of silent prayer, again, is a time for you to enter into what the Apostle John said the, just a few years before he died, when he said to believers, not to unbelievers, but to believers, he said, if we confess our sins, if we believers confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, with that in mind, a moment of silent prayer is a time of preparation, and therefore, let us pray. Father, we are grateful and thankful for the opportunity you've given us to gather together this evening to study your word. We are grateful for those who are here face to face and those who are here in our non-face to face congregation. And as we enter into our study this evening, we do pray for certain members of our royal family who now have gone through certain situations where in some cases, some loved ones have gone home to be with the Lord. And we thank God that there's a home for those who have believed upon your son, Jesus Christ. But more than that, Father, we are excited about the time when we can look forward to the gathering together of the saints in the clouds of the year. For one day that trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and those who are alive and remain will forever be caught up together with him and with your son Jesus Christ and forever be with him. So we are excited about the times in which we are living in. Challenge us with the information that we are about to note this evening. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we do pray. Amen. We remember, I have to just remind you of this major principle. We are not covering the lives of those involved in the different dispensations. We're not covering the life of Abraham, uh, Jake, uh, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, but we are covering their lives as it relates to the different dispensations that we are studying. So far, we are dealing with our fourth chart. If you have that chart, I, I, again, I'd like to have one of the deacons take care of this. I've asked it uh, for the past week or so. It's 
still hasn't happened. Maybe someone can make it happen, but I'd like to have more charts to get ready to pass out for those who may not have any of these charts. But we are now on our fourth chart in the doctrine of dispensation, which deals with the dispensation of promise. And so far, if anyone needs a chart, please raise your hand. Anyone need a chart? Okay, Carlos. And don't worry, if you need one, you've already had one. You've probably lost one, like I lose everything every day in life anyway. So it doesn't matter. As long as I don't lose my salvation and lose you. Those are the two things I don't want to do. Lose my salvation or lose you unless it's, of course, a part of the plan of God. So again, keep your hands up as Carlos does pass those out. And you're able to give him $20 as a tip if you desire to do so. If not, he will just continue to say you are cheap SOBs. Those are son of Belial's, by the way, so don't accuse me of saying something wrong. But so far, we have covered in our chart in the doctrine of dispensation. We have opened up with the first section of this dispensation. And uh, in the chart, the dispensation is the one called promise. The opening event is, the, is what we have spent time on, where God calls Abraham, known as Abram, and gives him promises. These promises are found in Genesis 12, 1 through 7. Genesis 13, that should be 14 through 17. I've got to correct that. I keep on trying to do it, and I forget. Genesis 15, 5. And then God repeats these promises to Isaac and Jacob in Genesis 21, 26, 1 through 5. We'll see what he says to Isaac. And then to Jacob in Genesis 28, 10 through 15. Then we will see man's responsibility, Abraham's responsibility, was simply to believe and obey. And this is where we are. If we had a chance to study in more detail the life of Abraham when he was called Abram, we would have seen that while Abraham was enjoying blessings as Abram because of his obedience to follow the Lord, his old friends, Abraham's gone forth from the era of the Chaldees. Meanwhile, back home, things are not falling apart as of yet in the year of the Chaldees. While Abraham is enjoying blessings because he's made good decisions as he goes forward to follow the uh, plans of the Lord in his own way, and uh, he follows the Lord and his old friends, however, the followers of the moon god, or Allah, were now being tortured. They were being enslaved and they were being disposed of everything that they owned. And that's very important. Therefore, when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, he was entering into the peak, the Ur of the Chaldees, not Abraham, but the Ur of the Chaldees was entering into the peak of its prosperity. They were prospering at the time. And he appeared to be leaving a sure thing. And in other words, people would look at the life of Abram and they'd say, why are you leaving? Your father is related to Ur of the Chaldees. Your father is a very popular worshiper of the moon god. It's a good thing. You're leaving a short thing, Abraham. You're leaving something that you could enjoy. It was a good thing, but in reality, it was not. Because many times we think that we're leaving something good, when in reality we are leaving something that would be destroying our life if it were given its time. And therefore, he left the Ur of Chaldees at its peak. Why did he leave it at its peak? What was it that Abraham actually chose? And what did he choose over the Ur of the Chaldees? What did he choose over the moon god? Well, Hebrews 11:8 tells us what he chose. It says, by faith or literally by means of doctrine, resident in his soul. When it says by faith, it doesn't mean by faith, hoping that something's going to happen. It means by pistis, so by means of doctrine, resident in the soul. Abraham, when he was called, notice when he was called, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, and then say the next two words with me. He went out, what's the next two words? Not what? not knowing where he was going. Abraham is going to make a major transition in his life. However, and we have to learn a lot of biblical principles from what we are studying, you don't make a major change like this without doctrine. Be very careful. A lot of individuals make major changes in their lives only to find out a few months later or a year later or a couple of years later they made a wrong decision. 
Time will always tell. God will reveal what is right and what is wrong. God will bring the truth to pass. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5 says there will come a time when God will actually expose the motivations of men's hearts and then every man will have praise from God or lack of praise from God. The point is you don't make a major change like this without Bible doctrine in your life. In your lifetime, and here's a great principle because it's happened to all of us already, it will happen to some of you this year, and it will happen to some of you in the future. You don't make a major change like this because you are going to be faced with some major decisions in your life. And at times, they will be radical decisions that will call for a literal uprooting from going to one place to another, from one situation to another, from time to time. How do you know you are doing the right thing? There's only one way you're going to know you're doing the right thing, by faith by means of doctrine resident in your soul. Hebrews 11.8 tells us what is needed. You have to focus in on this. Not what the pastor says, not what the loved ones say, not what your friends say, not what family members say, but what does Hebrews 11.8 say? By means of doctrine, by means of faith resident in the soul. All sorts of things are involved in the principle here. And the point is, how do you know you're doing the right thing? How do you know you're making the right decision? I always recall to mind a woman that uh, uh, actually took a, a teaching job in Detroit City for three times as much money as she was getting paid in Providence, Rhode Island. And she's got a lot of prosperity, but she lost her spiritual relationship with God. How do you know that you're making the right decision in your life? You need to understand how to choose the will of God. Whether it's going from one job to another, whether it's going from one business to another, from one relationship to another, from one situation to another, from one friend to another, maybe from one um, a marital friend, maybe from the right man or right woman. How do you know you're making the right decision? All sorts of things are involved in the principle here. And the point is, how do do you know that you're doing the right thing? How can you know? I can't tell you. I'll tell you one thing I can tell you. Do not make a decision based upon how you feel. Are you listening? Don't make a decision based upon how you feel. I've seen people say, I can't take it anymore. They made a decision based upon how they felt. Don't make a decision by how you feel. Because emotions cannot think. Repeat. Emotions cannot think. You never make a decision based upon how you feel because feelings will lie to you. One day you're in love, the next day you say, what was I thinking of? One day you're going in a certain direction, the next day you, you say, how stupid could I be? You never make a decision based upon how you feel. You make a decision based upon what you think. Shout amen, somebody. Because I'll get Pentecostal on you this evening. How do you know if it's God's will? God doesn't open up the sky, by the way, and say, it's my will. He doesn't say, I want you to close your eyes and turn to a page in the Bible, close your eyes and point to the verse, and that's the verse that you, it's going to tell you what my word is. I always quote Malachi 3.2, where God says, I'm going to spread dung in your face. That's great. That's great right there. What's the will of God? I'm going to spread dung in your face. Oh, I love that one, God. Don't make a decision based upon your, your feelings. That will lie to you. God does not open up the sky and say, it's my will. God doesn't say, all right, I want you to stand out in the wind. I want you to go out in the wind. I want you to put up a little piece of paper. And if the paper goes left, you go left. If the paper goes right, you go right. And listen to what I say through the paper blowing in the wind. The answer, my friend, is not blowing in the wind. The answer is not blowing in the wind. That's why I don't sing in the choir. Now you know. It's not going to be blowing in the wind. God, you cannot say, God, guide me in whatever way you want me to go. And you're not going to discover the will of God by doing that. You're not going to discover the will of God by walking down the main aisle of the church when the pastor is teaching and interrupt service and sit down. Oh, I'm sorry, John. I didn't see you doing that. I'm sorry, Mr. Medeiros. So oh, that's Pastor John. You all said, poor Mr. Medeiros, give him up. Deacon Medeiros has been through a lot before service. 
he, stand, he stood in the gap for you, and he had to be there for all kinds of problems that we had. And I can't even believe you made it back to church. I thought you were going to go up to that place up the street that we like that has those little things in the bottle that kind of give us our excitement from now and then. But you don't do that. But that's the type of mumbo-jumbo that people have that a lot of believers practice today. They want the Bible to answer them the, the will of God. The Bible's not going to give you the will of God by what you feel. God doesn't answer that like that. God says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples, my methates. Then, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and what would the truth do it'll make you free it doesn't say go outside and put your hand in the sky and ask which way God is coming down for you or someone has said something like this I just had a gut feeling I have a gut feeling well I have a gut feeling too it's called agita if you're Italian it means I had a hot burn because I had too many uh, hot dogs or or sausages on on July 4th now, I had neither, so don't blame me for that. I'm just illustrating. I don't want anybody to be turned off on the fact that your pastor eats hot dogs and, and uh, sausages. There's nothing wrong with that, but we've got a member of our church missing tonight because he had agita. Why? Because you can't, go by, you can't go by a gut feeling. I just had a gut feeling. You did? I don't feel, I didn't feel right about the situation. You didn't? Yeah, so that's why I married her. I knew she was the right one. Why? Because I saw in her eyes, when I said, honey, I love you, she looked into the sky and the moon reflected on her head. And I said, she is the one. Woman, oh, woman. No, it doesn't sound like, it doesn't go like that, does it? Not at all. By the way, I'm having fun, if you, if you don't mind. I didn't have a July 4th holiday like some of you, celebrating in the way you celebrate. I was just suffering for Jesus, studying his word, loving every moment of it. All of these things, I'll just tease it. All of these things have nothing to do with divine guidance. Anyway, any, amen? But let me give you a, a concept that I've given you before, because there are different ways that you can receive divine guidance if you desire to receive it from the plan of God, and it comes from the Word of God. Let me illustrate it. Look in your Bibles now to Acts chapter 11, and look at verse 5. Because I'm going to give you certain principles. In fact, there are eight principles that I'm going to give you where you can discover what the will of God is for your life. Number one, there is always guidance through prayer. Prayer is not a problem-solving device, but sometimes you will receive guidance from God simply by praying. Some of you need to get more confidence in the fact that when you do pray, God does hear you. Some of you think God does not hear you because you look at your life and you feel guilty. You feel condemned. You have a low self-image about yourself. You think you're a failure. You're a winner. The very fact that you're a winner re is revealed by the fact that you're here tonight. Look at the Word of God. Look at what God says. Start seeing yourself as God sees you. God says, I've written a book of remembrance about your life that every time you gather together, your name has been written down in the historical record section of heaven in Malachi 3.10, where I record the fact that instead of you staying home watching some boob tube movie, you're here learning the Word of God. And God wants you to know that he hears your prayer. There is guidance through prayer. Look what Peter said in Acts 11, verse 5. I'm going to give you chapters and verse now. He says, I was in the city of Joppa. And what was he doing? I was praying. And I was in a trance. This is the New Testament now before the Bible was completed. So there's nothing wrong with being in a trance. And he said, I saw a vision. A certain object coming down like a great sheep lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. Please notice right here, he says, I was in a trance, I saw a vision, I was praying, and he was open up to the fact that whether or not God was going to guide him. Notice in verse 6, so we have number one, guidance through prayer. Number two, in verse 6, there's guidance through what we call objective thinking. Now, objective thinking means you don't think everything's about yourself. Subjective thinking means you think everything's about you. Objective, objective thinking of Bible doctrine, not subjective, but objective, is really good because it means that what you're open to is the fact that God's going to speak to you. And when he does, you may like what he hears, you hear, but you may not like what you hear. Look at verse 6. When I had, now notice he's praying, now he says, when I had fixed my gaze upon it, 
What, what was it? The trance, the vision. I was observing. There's his objective thinking. He's, ob he's observing. He was wondering what this is all about. See, he could say, oops, there it is. What is this all about? He said, I saw the four-footed animals. He's wondering why he can eat certain fruits, why he can't. He said, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. What's he saying? That he now had begun to see that there's guidance when you pray to God and you have objective thinking of Bible doctrine. You let God speak to you through his word. Look at verses 7 through 10. There's also guidance through perception and the recall of doctrine. You've learned the word of God over the years and God says, you know what I want you to do now? Do you remember what you learned last, last year? Do you remember what you learned six months ago, five months ago, two months ago, or last week? You say, yes, I learned something. What is God saying? Now it's time for you to recall what I taught you. I told you I was going to teach you. I told you there were going to be problems in your life. I told you to get ready for the tragedies, the disasters, and the attacks made upon you. I want you to recall what the doctrine says. Remember when Paul had a thorn in the flesh? He said, I asked the Lord three times for it to be removed. And he said, here was the answer that the Lord had said to me months ago, years ago. My grace is sufficient for you. What did he do? He recalled doctrine. Some of you are actually asking God for guidance and direction, and you remember, wow, I remember what happened to Sarah. I remember what happened to Abraham. I remember what happened to the Apostle Paul. You recall doctrine. What is God doing? He's guiding you through his will and through his word. He's not doing that flaky, fluffy stuff, pick a card in the 50 decks, and if it's red, it means go. If it's black, it means don't. No, it's recalling Bible doctrine. Look what he said in verse 7. Now remember, he's in the church age. He said, I also heard a voice saying to me, the voice represents the word of God because God sp spoke to the New Testament saints through a voice. God's word is a voice. And the voice said, now notice Peter's wondering what he should eat and what he should not eat when it comes to the food that was set before him because he was told by the Jews that they couldn't eat certain types of food. But he said, I heard a voice saying to me, arise, Peter. And what did the voice say? Do what? Kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened. Notice that God doesn't just speak to us once, does he? This happened how many times? Three times. And everything was drawn back up into the sky. What did he recall? He recalled through perception and Bible doctrine what God had said. Look at verse 11. There's guidance to what we call providential circumstances, which means the people that we meet. How many times have you asked God for guidance and direction, and you stopped at Dunkin' Donuts, and you met a friend, and the friend happens to say something and give you an answer to something you were searching for that they had no idea you were searching for? The friend maybe had said, you know what's really good? When the Bible says, ask and you shall receive. I love that verse. Seek and you shall find. And little do they know when they said that to you, that they were answering a question that you had about a problem you were going through. God was saying through them, ask. God was saying through them, seek and you shall find. That's called guidance through providential circumstances. God using people that we meet on a day-by-day -day basis to actually guide us. Look at verse 11. And behold, at that moment, notice what he says, at that moment, when he was actually searching for the will of God. Notice the number three again, because three represents who? The Trinity. This, he had three times in verse 10. It happened three times in verse 10. In verse 11, behold, at that moment, three men appeared before the house in which we were staying these are three men, guidance through people now, having sent to me from Caesarea. Notice that there's guidance through people. Sometimes God will bring a person in your life that will give you the answer to the problem that you're facing. Doesn't this make a lot more sense than closing your eyes and pointing to a verse in the Bible and saying, this is what God wants? It's foolish, but that's what people follow today. Then, of course, look at verse 12. There's guidance through being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the humility to obey. Notice what it says in verse 12. The Spirit told me. The Spirit can't tell you unless you're filled with the Spirit. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. Don't doubt. And these six brethren 
These six brethren, now the Trinity is multiplied, also went, met, went with me, and we entered the man's house. Please notice, guidance through the filling of the Holy Spirit, the humility to obey and follow God. Verses 13 through 14, guidance through fellowship and comparison of spiritual facts. In other words, you learned one thing from Sunday morning's message. Someone else learned something else. Now you compare your spiritual facts. Verse 13, and he reported to us how he had seen the angel. Notice in verse 12, the Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. And these six brethren also went with me. We entered a man's house. The man's house that we entered into, he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, that's Peter, who is also called Peter, brought here. And he shall speak words to you by which you will be saved, and you and all your household. Please notice guidance through comparing spiritual facts. Verses 15 through 16, guidance through recalling of doctrine. As I began to speak, verse 15, the Holy Spirit fell upon who? Who did it fall upon? Other people, not just yourself. It fell upon them, Acts 11, 15, just as the Holy Spirit did upon us at the beginning. And I, what's the next word? Remembered, guidance to recall, the word of the Lord, how we used to say, John baptized with water, but now you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And of course, not mentioned, but a very important principle concerning how God guides us. And this is an overrated uh, one in the sense, not overrated, it's an underrated one in the sense that God guides us through disaster, doesn't he? What did he do to Abraham? He brought his father home. He brought his father. I don't know if the father went home. He killed his father. God is through the disaster. Anyway, these are just simply some biblical guideline principles that are found in the Word of God. Not any of the nonsense that we see today where people think that God's going to guide them through feeling, through emotion, or through the wind blowing somewhere. Now, in our study, we're now ready for Genesis 12, verse 1. So let's go back there as we begin with the order given to Abram when he was uh, beginning at the Ur of the Chaldees. This is the system used so commonly in Jewish writing. writing. It's a system which we call, it's a part of Jewish uh, style, which is called retrospective exposition. What do I mean by retrospective ex exposition? Uh, retrospectively, we go back to the fact that God did something to us last year, or maybe the last, in the last six months, and now we begin to recall what God has done for us. We have a retrospective type of attitude. We say, I remember what God did. Abram had to do that. Because now we go from Genesis 11, remember when he left Ur of the Chaldees? Now we go to Genesis chapter 12. Retrospectively, we bring things up to date, and it says this. Now the Lord said to Abram, it's telling us what happened in Genesis 11. In ver beginning, you know, uh, verses 26 through 32. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, he said this way back in the era of Ch the Chaldees, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house and go forth to the land which I will what? I will show you. Now Abram's getting some guidance. And he says, I'm going to make you, here's the guidance from God, Here's the divine promise in the dispensation of promise, Abraham. I'm going to make you a great what? A great nation. But not only that, I'm going to bless you. I'm not only that, I'm going to make your name great. So you, Abram, Abraham, you be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And if anyone curses you, I will curse. This is a divine promise from God under the dispensation of promises. And in you... All the families of the earth, the Portuguese, the Irish, the Italians, the English, the Chinese, the Asians, the Russians, all the families of the earth shall be what? They will be blessed. Actually, in verse 1, the Hebrew puts it like this. Now, Jehovah, J-H-W-H is what it says, not Jesus as we know, but it refers to Jesus Christ, not spoke to Abraham, but had spoken to Abram. Spoke to him like a, a few years ago. Go with reference to yourself from your land and from your relatives and from the place of your birth to the land which I will cause you to see. And by the way, Abraham, Abraham was not only given the promise, but God said, I'm going to give you an insight. I'm going to let you see the land I'm going to give you. And God brought him to a mountain as we're going to see. And he saw Iraq. He saw Iran. 
He saw, he saw Kuwait. He saw all the Middle East countries from afar off. And God said, someday they will all belong to you. And God says, to promise you, so that you can be comfortable with this, I'm going to make you a promise, and it's going to be called a covenant between me and you. And this is known as what we've noted in the past, known as the Abrahamic covenant. And what is known as an unconditional covenant. What does unconditional mean? It means this is what? No what? No conditions. In other words, God says, I'm going to do this for you, Abraham, no matter what you do. I don't care if you fail. I don't care if you blow it. I don't care if you fall flat on your face. I'm going to give you an unconditional covenant. All you have to do is believe. It's already been given to you. The Abrahamic covenant or agreement is what we call an unconditional covenant or promise. That's why we call this the dispensation of promise. It's between God as party of the first part in favor of Abraham and his descendants as the party of the second part. Unconditional means no strings attached. And this, this covenant has what we call temporal and eternal aspects. The temporal and eternal aspects of this covenant guarantees the nation of Israel a permanent national existence and a perpetual title to the land of promise in material and spiritual blessings that come through Christ. In other words, God doesn't say, I'm not, God didn't just say, I'm not just going to give you land. I promise that with the land, I'm also going to give you what kind of blessings? Spiritual. You're going to have material blessings. You're going to have spiritual blessings that come through Christ. And as we noted on Sunday morning, this is why this Satan tries to destroy whose seed? Abraham's seed. Because Abraham's seed is the Jews and the nation of Israel. And by the way, what does he use to try to destroy Abraham's seed? Does he use war? Does he use uh, the evil of nationalism in the sense of being internationalist? What does he try to use? He tries to use religion. The covenant guarantees the fact that Abraham is going to be given spiritual and natural blessings in spite of what Satan tries to do. Satan's big power does not come through war. It comes through using religion. Religion is the devil's ace trump. It's what he uses more than any other weapon to try to destroy the people of Israel. But this covenant is very interesting. I'll tell you why. It's not a covenant that is just given. Now, notice this. You should be excited about this. This covenant is not a covenant just given to the Jews. This covenant also guaranteed Gentile nations a share in these blessings. In Genesis 12, verse 3. That's why Satan, who is the father of religion, desires to destroy any nation that is for the Jews or for Israel. Because what the Abrahamic covenant does is it says it promises that Israel is going to be a nation under God. But along with Israel, there's going to be nations like the United States of America. There's going to be nations like China. There's going to be nations like Russia. There's going to be nations all throughout the world that are going to be blessed because they're related to Abraham. Because God promised a covenant to Abraham and that covenant is what kind of condition? Unconditional. Unconditional. That's why Satan tries to destroy them. It all began when Abraham became a Jew at age 99. There was no Jewish race from when Abraham was uh, up to when Abraham was 98. There was no Jewish race. At age 99, it began, that began the Jewish race with Abraham. And what was the sign? Circumcision. And by the way, that's cutting off the male skin of the, the, skin of the male phallus. Circumcision was the sign as given in all these passages. You have them circumcised in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, 13, 15 through 16, 15, 18, 22, 15 through 18, Genesis 26, 3 through 4, Exodus 6, 2 through 8. All of these are covenants and promises that God says, I promise you, I want you to make sure that people, male believers, uh, and male believers who follow the, the uh, word of God will be circumcised as a sign of the fact that they believe in the covenant that God had given them. And by the way, you know what's interesting is the fact that the Muslim Bible, which I gave you enough references on Sunday morning, says this is not true. Because in their Bible, Surah 2, 140 says, Do you say that Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes were Jews or Christians? Do you think you know better than Allah? 
They were not Jews or Christians. That's what it's saying. Who is more unjust than those who conceal the testimony that they have from Allah? Meaning that the Quran accuses Christians uh, and Jews of literally lying about what? The covenant. What covenant? What covenant? The Abrahamic covenant. The unconditional covenant. Now the Bible, the word of God says that Abraham became a Jew at age 99. Look at Genesis 17, 1 through 8. This is all important for you to understand so that you understand what dispensation we are a part of. Genesis 17, 1 through 8. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, how old? 99. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Now, then notice what he says. Walk before me, Abraham, and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face. God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of what? Nations. Does that say you shall be a father of the Jews only? Or Israel? No. A multitude of nations. Whatever nation you are from, Abraham is your father if you're born again and saved. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but now your name shall be called what? Abraham. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings shall come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Not just a God to you, but to your descendants, including Gentiles. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you, I will give to you the land of your sojournings. Everywhere that Abraham walked during his lifetime, God said that land someday is going to be yours. Now can you see why the Arabs can't stand Abraham? Now can you see why they try to attack the Jews? Why? Because if you're from Kuwait, if you're from Iran, if you're from Iraq, if you're from Saudi Arabia, if you're, if you're from any Middle East nation, you're told that someday that land is not going to belong to you anymore. It's going to belong to people that are related to Abraham. That's what the Bible says. The Quran, however, the so-called book of the, uh, of the uh, Muslims, says just the opposite. It says that it doesn't matter. You, know, you have a choice, by the way. You can either believe the Quran, which according to their own history, came from a stone that fell out of heaven that hit Muhammad on his head and said, write what you've heard after I hit you on your head and put it down in writing so that people can understand that this is what my plan is for you. Or you can believe that the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You choose. Now, we do have a set of books, by the way, in the Muslim religion called the Hadith. And in the Hadith, which is a commentary on the Quran, and it is Muhammad's teaching, in the Hadith he says, Allah has commanded me to fight against who? The Christians, the Jews, and the pagans, until they submit to Islam or be killed. So you have a choice. You either have to follow a book that dropped out of the sky in a stone tablet and hit someone on the head and end up with Allah, the moon god, or you can follow what Peter said. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. It's exciting, isn't it, to hear these things? But you won't, you're not really going to appreciate these things unless you deal with a Muslim someday or unless you really care of how to defend the faith. Like I mentioned on, on Sunday morning, you know, I was excited. Even my own grandson, John John, said, you know what, Pops, he goes, that was a great message when you started telling people that unless they are ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in them, they shouldn't even open up their mouth. Said, uh, how old is he, 12 years old, John? A 12-year-old boy. Huh. Look what 2 Peter says, the book that we follow. It says, 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse... Oh, boy. Let's start with verse 19. We have the prophetic word made more sure, God's word. 
to which we do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in da a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's Jesus Christ. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Why? No prophecy was ever given or was ever made by an act of human will, but the prophecy was made by men moved by who? The Holy Spirit who spoke from God. I believe in the prophecy that came from the Holy Spirit who spoke from God. Do you know what the definition of divine inspiration is? Notice this. I'll go through it slowly. Divine inspiration tells us that we have a book. A book whereby God the Holy Spirit. Now notice this. I'm going to go slow so you can get this. Not that you're dumb, but it's a great definition. It has a lot of meaning. It's a book. The Bible is a book whereby God the Holy Spirit so supernaturally directed the human writers of Scripture. Okay, you got that? God the Holy Spirit directed the writers of Scripture that without wavering, wavering their human intelligence, he used their IQ, without wavering their individuality, he wanted them to maintain who they are, their literary style, write how they could write, their personal feelings or any other human factor, that God's complete and coherent message to man was recorded in what kind of accuracy? Perfect accuracy in what kind of language? The original languages of scripture, the very words bearing the authority of divine authorship, authorship from God. Repeat, by the way, this is one of the definitions or one of the questions you have when you were getting ordained. When I got ordained by Colonel Abi Theme Jr., he asked me to recite this and I recited it word for word because it meant that much to me. And I recited it word for word because I believed it. But again, the Bible is a book whereby God, the Holy Spirit, so supernaturally directed the human writers of Scripture that without waving their human intelligence, he kept them with their own IQ, their individuality, they have their own personality, their literary style, the way that they write, all of us write differently, their personal feelings or any other human factor that God's own complete and coherent message to man was recorded in perfect accuracy in the original languages of, of Scripture, the very words bearing the authority of divine authorship. You can believe that. You can believe some book fell out of the sky with a rock that hit by, by a guy at 12 years old in the head. <laughs> and he came up with divine viewpoint. I set before you life and death. Choose what you want to choose. Look at Deuteronomy. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30 for a moment. Let me remind you of how the writer Moses put it. Because this is something that I think we all need to be reminded of. And there's so much information given in these studies that it's not worth going through it quickly just to say I got through it. But look what Moses said, Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. He said, see, I have set before you, Moses is talking to the children of Israel, Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, and the 15th verse. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. One of them, by the way, was the book of Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity. I've set before you death and adversity here in that I command you today that you should love the Lord your God to walk in his ways, fulfill the pre-designed plan of God, keep his commandments, his doctrines, and his statutes and his judgments so that you may live and what? Multiply, be fruitful and what? Multiply. And that the Lord your God may bless you in whatever place you go in the land which you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You're going to reap what you sow. You shall not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. That's the promised land. He said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death. I've set before you the blessing and the curse. He says, choose what? Life. In order that you may live, you and your what? Your descendants, your children, your loved ones. And how do you do this? By loving the Lord your God, by obeying his doctrine, and by holding fast to him, clinging to him. For this is your life. 
This is the length of your days, how you live a long time, that you may live in the land which the Lord God swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. Please notice, this is our life. So the Abrahamic covenant defines the fact that what God did to the children of Israel, he also did for us. Go back to Genesis chapter 12, and we'll close with this final chapter in verse 2. As a reminder of where we are and what God has done for us. Genesis 12, 2. Don't get familiar with this. And wait till we get to Jacob and Isaac and how they had to deal with this with their own children and remind them of what they were going through. He said, I will make you a great nation in Genesis 12, 2. He's talking to Abraham now. And he's not saying this just to us. He's saying this to Abraham. And then if we're related to Abraham, then we reap what Abraham has sowed. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And so you shall be a what? Blessing. That's not what the Muslim Bible says. That's, what not, that's not what the Islamic religion says. That's what, not what the Arab holy book says. In fact, in Surah 2, 124, it says, Remember that Abraham was tried by his Lord with certain commands which he fulfilled. He said, I will make thee an imam to the nations. They're very interesting because an imam is a male leader of the mosque or we would say a prophet of their religion. He says to Abraham, I will make thee an iman, a male leader to the nations, he pleaded, and also imams from my offspring, he answered. But my promise is not within the reach of evildoers. Then he goes on to say in verse 125, I don't have that here with me, he goes on to say that the evildoers has to do with the Jews and the Christians. We're the evildoers. And again, again, the principle is that we are dealing with a religion that contradicts the Bible, and we are dealing with a religion that always questions the Word of God. And where did that come from? Well, since we're in the book of Genesis, look at Genesis 3. Let me remind you where questioning God's Word comes from, and I'll let you go. Remember where it comes from, because, you know, we've got a verse in the book of Jeremiah which says, the leopard has not changed his spots. Satan hasn't changed, has he? Look at verse 1. The serpent was more crafty than any, be any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God really said this? That's what the Muslim Bible says. That, did God really say this? You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you, You're not going to die. Once again he lies. God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. I concur with what Solomon said. Ecclesiastes 1.9. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? The same lie being perpetuated in the Garden of Eden is the same lie being perpetuated today, to us today. So the Abrahamic covenant defines the Jewish race as the citizens of the first, and notice this, the last client nation in history. The first client nation in all of history were the Jews. The last one will be the Jews. In between, we will be a part of that. Aren't you excited? That we will be a part of the fact that Abraham's promises will now be passed down to us. Simply because we did one thing, we actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ so that we could be saved. And as Genesis 15, 6 says, look at it, Genesis 15, 6 tells us exactly what Abraham did and what we do and why we are considered to be saved individuals. Notice what it says. Genesis 15, verse 6. Then he, Abraham, what did he do? Abraham what? Believed in the Lord. Being because he believed in the Lord, the Lord reckoned or credited to him as perfect righteousness. Abraham believed in the Lord. The Lord credited that belief to him as perfect righteousness. You and I have the same promises given to Abraham because you and I have done the same thing Abraham did. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we could be saved. Isn't God fantastic? Give him a nice round of applause. <laughs> Father, thank you for your promise. Thank you for this dispensation. Uh, guarantee that we'll ex be excited about these things as the days approach. We ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we do pray. Amen. Thank you.